ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Ravi Mayuram. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you all had a nice lunch. And I'm sure you're all excited to see one more keynote for the next hour and a half with a guy standing here droning away to glory. So <clears throat> I thought to make it more exciting for you and uh, awake you from your stupor, do this in a revolutionary different format. <laughs> Remember, revolution is just a small change. So it's a small change. What we will do <clears throat> this time around is walk the talk. Instead of me giving you all the philosophy behind or how it was done and what we have built, we will actually demonstrate it for you. Uh, you heard me in the morning talk about the various uh, myths that we wanted to bust uh, about elasticity, about the database running in the cloud. Let's show you that <clears throat> about how fall tolerant it needs to be. That will give you a demonstration of all the way from the cloud to the edge. Uh, then I talked about the uptime stuff. You'll get to see that in terms of uh, how it works from all the way from the cloud to the edge. We'll show you the elasticity capabilities. And finally, uh, back end coming directly to the consumer. Um, we will give you how that actually is impacting or how that's happening in various uh, segments. This time we'll take uh, healthcare as the area in which we want to give you a, a sense of that. Now, in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to invite up onto the stage my co-conspirator from so many previous keynotes, uh, Mr. Perry Krug. <laughs> Welcome, Perry. Hey, Ravi. Thanks for having me back again. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. So, Perry, set the stage up for us as to what you got in store this time. Yeah, well, it's great to be back here. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us, for coming out today. Uh, Ravi, it's a pleasure to be back on stage with you again. Um, I'm reminded of the, the many demos that we've done, we've done together, starting with just some, some simple key value stuff, mm -hmm. uh, moving through that, that flight search uh, yes, application. Yes, we auctioned off the Maserati. We gave away Doug's Maserati that one year. Yeah, it reminded um, me of somebody. Yeah. Doesn't and then uh, last year, we added uh, full text and analytics to the demo. Uh, this year is going gonna, is gonna to set the set the bar again, we're even add, adding mobile to the mix. Fantastic. I think since we got so much stuff to show, and especially mobile, let's, uh, how do you say, add one more helper to this whole thing to get the show going. Sounds good. Fantastic. Let me invite up on stage Sachin Smotra, who will help us uh, bring the whole mobility angle to life here. Welcome on, Sachin. Thank you, Ravi. Fantastic. It's great to be here, and I'm really stoked to be showing Couchbase Mobile at the, at the Connect keynote. Fantastic. So start us off, Sachin, by giving us a sense of uh, the application, uh, what we are going to be demonstrating. Maybe, Perry, you can give us a sense of what the application is, and uh, Sachin can uh, channel the the other end of it, the receiving end of it. Yep, yep, sounds good. So, um, you know, in the past years, we've always taken an approach of uh, some of some of our innovative customers uh, out there building applications of their own. Um, so this year, we decided to, to tackle the healthcare industry, uh, a number of our customers building uh, revolutionary applications. Um, and so we tried to, we decided to take a stab at it uh, ourselves. Um, healthcare is on, is on everybody's mind. It's one of the many industries that are being uh, revolutionized. So I think uh, we should just go right, go right into the demo. Go right into it. Um, so here, uh, this whole demo is being run live, um, uh, and hopefully it all works. Um, <laughs> This is the, the dashboard of the application that we've built. We're not going to go through all of the, the charts and graphs uh, now, but everything uh, that you see today, all of the data is, is stored uh, within the Couchbase platform, and we'll go through the, the details as we get started. Um, let me hand it over to Sachin, um, if you want to give a, a bit about the, the mobile application. Sure. So uh, we've, killed, uh, we've created a healthcare app that showcases patient engagement with a view of the future where IoT sensors are an integral part of the healthcare ecosystem. What I have is an Android application that is running on uh, my uh, Motorola Nexus device. And this application, let me just bring this up. You'll see this pop up on screen, keeps track of all of my health metrics. And is in this world of connected health, with my permission, 
it can um, go ahead and alert my doctor when things change around me. Uh, this app is going to be working with one more component that we have, which is an IoT sensor, which is a battery-less near-field communications-based uh, temperature patch that was created by Texas Instruments. And so I'm going to show you exactly how this is going to take my temperature. I'm going to place that on the lectern over here. And this device has near-field communications enabled. I'm just going to bring it right next to it. And there we go. So you can see that it's just gone ahead and taken the reading of the, the surface right here. So it's pretty much between 65 and, and, and 66 uh, right now. <laughs> and as I do You're this. You're all feeling a little chilly, are you? <laughs> so, I can and, and guys, this is all happening live. We just had to order a few of these patches because I ended up dropping a few of these in hot water as well. <laughs> uh, just, to, just to see how that would be. So, um, uh, uh, Sachin, give us a sense of what's running on the device. So, the, the, the application is a native Android application built with Couch Based Lite, mm -hmm. our full featured embedded NoSQL database for mobile devices. So, all this data that we're seeing here, uh, the temperature is actually stored locally. Everything is being stored locally here. Fantastic. So, to prove that point, let me go ahead and move this phone into uh, airplane mode. Mm -hmm. And then I can go ahead and Take a couple more readings. As you can see over here, that's, there's a little bit of a difference in the temperature, but not much. Sure. It's the same general uh, temperature that we're seeing. So while I was doing that, Fantastic. again. So Sachin, imagine you're carrying such a device and you're off onto your fabulous vacation in some remote part of the world. And let's say, you know how it can happen in these vacations, you fall sick. Right. Simulate a situation what generally happens in that you fall sick over there and there is no network availability you showed not having network availability. So perhaps you can give us a sense of how the application would work. Sure, so uh, the application is always on. And as while we were talking, Perry just put uh, some hot water. You can see the steam coming out of here um, on the patch. So, um, sorry, in a cup. And I'm gonna like keep the patch next to this uh, cup so that I can heat this up. Mm -hmm. So wherever I am, whether I'm online or offline, yep. all of the temperature readings of this patch are being captured on my device. And now that I have this patch heated up a little bit, Carefully, you don't burn your fingers. <laughs> Thanks, Ferry. Let me just put the patch back on and then take yet another reading here. And you can see that the uh, temperature has gone uh, dramatically up. It's not warm enough. Let's see if we can get something warmer than that. And this is piping hot water that uh, I think uh, the staff here got from uh, the closest Starbucks. So I'm just going to keep it right next to it and then um, hang on to it for long. So um, while he's trying to warm the thing up, Perry, give us a sense of what's on the, uh, how the stack is. On the, uh, yeah, the so, so the, the server side of things, this is all written in a, a Node.js uh, application uh, using the uh, Node.js SDK, the Couchbase uh, SDK. Um, and we'll go take a look at the, uh, um, the cluster um, in a little bit. Um, there, now looks like you're- uh, So you're value for high. money, people. Just about- water um, is warmer. <laughs> Just about burnt my fingers out there, but uh, as you can see, the, the temperature reading on the pack patch has spiked dramatically. So uh, it's gone up to 98.3, and, and this, is, this is me getting sick on my vacation and getting off a plane. <laughs> so let me just go ahead and uh, come back out of airplane mode. And then um, here I am, I've just gotten connected to my network. Yep, and there you see, we see that a little alert has popped up here. Um, if anybody else was paying attention, that used to be zero, it's now one. Um, if we click on that, um, we can go right through and click on Sachin's patient record. Um, and, and Ravi, here we have uh, mm -hmm. uh, some basic information about Sachin, um, wow. and we have the graph of his temperature. Um, and uh, we can use this page to, to explore his, his patient profile. So what I just saw was temperature readings happening offline and when the network availability was there, that information got synced to the server Exactly, side. it synced right up from the app, and now you see that we are connected, more of these readings are, are going through, and the graph is being updated uh, live as we, uh, as we speak here. Fantastic, now, you got the information over there, there's some reactive programming magic happening there that it immediately is set up your notification uh, going over there, and then when you clicked on it, you saw the patient who was having the problem. Now, if you look at the patient information, we see gender, birth date, address, phone number, it's phone number, that's pretty ancient. These days, look at this guy. Do you think he's gonna use just a phone number? This is the you know, engagement economy here. Uh, you're absolutely right, Robbie. Right? We are, so we are in a modern social world. social stuff going on. So how about, can we reach him through all those usual social channels? 
the WhatsApps and the Facebooks or sure. Let's let's take that? a look at let's take a look what we have. So if I jump into the Couchbase console, uh, we'll come back to this part in a minute. But look at our Nickel Query uh, workbench. Um, and so right within the platform from our UI, uh, we can ex start to explore the data. Um, so I take this uh, query. Looks very much like SQL. This is Nickel running, um, and we're going to choose. We're going to pull out the ID and name mm -hmm. um, of Sachin's record. Sure. Um, and so if I hit enter here, it takes a few seconds because we don't have his. Uh, we don't have the name field indexed. So indexed. this is basically an ad hoc query um, yep. that you might do to find a, a specific record. Sure. Um, there we have the, uh, the ID. Um, and so if I just copy that um, and come over to where we're actually storing the data, go into the documents, enter that ID, um, you can see Sachin's JSON document here. And this is... Uh since we are in the healthcare world, is there some standards and stuff this needs to follow? Yep, exactly. So all of this data is based off of the FHIR F -I -F -H -I uh, standard. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a standard uh, data model, one of the newer data models within healthcare, designed to be very extensible, um, but also provide some of the some standard fields. One of the ones you see that we're talking about now is uh, telecom, mm -hmm. um, and that's where within the FHIR standard you add uh, whatever uh, contact information. Very foresightful. They called it telecom. <laughs> you can add whatever you want inside it. We can. So. Okay. Uh, we have, for me. Yeah, we have uh, the, the phone number here. So, uh, Sachin, do you have a, a Facebook ID that we can look yeah. at? Sachin Smotra. At Sachin, Sachin Smotra. Smotra at Facebook. Yeah, we'll just do it this way. And then uh, your WhatsApp handle? Handle? Sure. Is it called a handle? Yeah, okay. I think so. I think just call it right. Sachin WhatsApp. Sachin, right, what, Sachin up? Sachin, what up? What up? Right. And uh, how about Snapchat? That's the new cool thing with all these kids. Uh, well, I don't have one, but for, I'll just pretend it's Snappy Sachin. <laughs> Snappy Sachin. Sounds good. So if we save this uh, document, we're editing the, editing the data live mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. um, save this, jump back into the application, refresh the page, and you can see that it pops up there. Fantastic. So what he really showed live here is schema extension. So what you have basically done is change the entire application now by adding new information. This is called schema evolution. If you want to do this in a relational system, you'll call a committee. And then you'll do this. And then by the time this application is up, it'll require a compilation, dev to test, push everything. This here, it happened on the glass. Why? Because it's got the power of JSON, which has got the flexibility, and the power of SQL on top of it, which is nickel and you're able to see this in the application instantaneously. Fantastic demonstration, but, but, but. there's an engagement world, people. Hmm. This needs to hit the, hit the guy on the street over there. So how is this going to make it to him? All right, let's see if you can show Ooh, it on the, me, on the mobile. Absolutely, so let me just go back into my cool uh, healthcare app. And as you see, we have a section here for patient profile. Mm -hmm. And ah, uh, hmm. as expected. Ah, there's such an, I, I don't see the, I don't, thing. Oh, you know what? You're in. You're back in airplane mode. Uh oh, so you're okay. not connected. All the squiggly JSONs, I think, made me fidgety. So I must have gone <laughs> back in the in the airplane mode. Let me go back, and uh, I am connected again over here. There we go. And there you now go. Now it's updated. Did you see that? That is the magic. All the way from server to the mobile, you've extended the application. It's not some data just showing up or some field being hidden. You're actually extending the entire application where you're able to add new capability to the application. If it were in the current world, what does it require is for you to change the application, change the bits, which means you have to now go to your favorite app store, beg their permission to deploy the new mobile app, and then the customer will have to go install it before they get to see all these changes. Here, nobody touched anything. He pushed it. All he had to do was get back into the, in the area of coverage, and the schema synced, and the data that came with that also synced out here. So fantastic. This is how the mobile is going to evolve, the engagement economy, where the information, the application will come to you. You don't have to go to that. Fantastic. Now, um, Perry, this is all very good, but you are the doctor. You're looking at one patient having this problem. Wouldn't you be interested in looking for what else is happening? Is anybody else? It, I, think it, I think it would be very interesting to try to find some other patients that are suffering from the same, uh, the same symptoms. So uh, what we did was um, we built into this application uh, an interface for the Couchbase full text search. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, the new service that's now uh, generally available with yes. 5.0. Yes, um, of today. And Please gives download us, the news 
gives us free form text search and, uh, and all those sort of things. So if I come here to our search uh, page, Sachin, you're, you're reporting a fever, I can see. Um, what, uh, what else, what other symptoms are you feeling? Maybe a bit of a headache. Bit of a headache, all right. So if I just in, enter all headache schemos, here, you know. um, and I'm gonna press. Um, Betty, sorry, little yes, English Bobby. help. What's, what's the matter? Headache is... Oh, I spelled, that's a really bad the spelling. Queen's English uses a um, e. You know what, but it's, it's okay, yeah. because with our full text engine, we support fuzzy matching and stemming and uh, some natural language processing, so this if This platform I, is built for some flat... Some hope, flat hopefully it, too, hopefully it deciphers my, my very poor spelling, right. um, but if we click there, there we go. Now we can see that we got a couple results back um, with headache uh, identified correctly, uh, yeah. even, even in the midst of my, uh, my poor spelling. Fantastic. It's actually, you can see, it looks for plural, so many other things. It can, all the variations. That's the power of stemming that you have inside the search system. And now you're able to basically see wherever that, the root word, the headache, is matching that. Fantastic, Perry. I see on the right-hand side uh, multiple ways to filter the stuff. Yep, those so are, that's our about, faceted, faceted navigation there. So in your facet, I see you have dating, date-based facets too, which is fantastic. So how about, what would you look for? You're the doctor. Uh, maybe I would want to see <laughs> patients that have reported uh, these symptoms in the last in the last couple of days. Sure. Right? So let's uh, let's drill down into uh, one to seven days worth. Um, you see that uh, 100 results or so is now down to 20. A bit more, yep. bit more manageable for us. 300 milliseconds, uh, not bad. Yeah. And then um, if I we, we built in here the ability to go and see where these patients are. Maybe we can ah. uh, get in touch with them more directly. So if I click Very on nice. map, um, we're going to see that load up, um, and we see it roughly centered around. If that loads in a few more seconds, seconds. That's all go. got to do with the Wi-Fi. That here. was the Wi-Fi here. I promise. Um, so what we're Let what me we're plug for the app and the platform here. <laughs> <laughs> what we're seeing here are the, the blue dots are patients, the red, the red uh, crosses, red and white crosses are the hospitals, um, and we are mixing the data, the JSON stored in Couchbase yep. um, with the Google Maps API um, so that we can display to you, the, the relevant, or to, to me, the relevant information. So there is the obligatory Google Map API REST interface that you can actually see this thing. But there is magic here, which is that the, any REST endpoint at the end of the day gives you a JSON. So now JSON is the playing field for us. So what our friends did here is to match that JSON that you get from there, which gives you geolocality. They took the address of the people, uh, of the patients they found in that search, geocoded that, took their, basically their street address, made it to a lat long, and then they mapped it onto the uh, uh, Google map with a proximity search to the hospitals over there. Yep, so yep, that's and this all is that is done in this one query here, which is the select star from where the facility and the resource type is a hospital, an order by and limit to one. That's the query that does all that processing. If you were to do it in any other way, there'll be pages of code. Am I right? Yep, exactly. So just one simple query, and we can use we can push down that to the push that down to the database, database. and let it do the processing, so that the application just has to read the, the results. Fantastic. So going back there, now that you figured out all these lovely patients by next to the hospitals, I think you would want to maybe inform them or get them. To... We might we might want to let them know. So from here, I'm just going to say, uh, you might be sick. Please make an appointment. Hopefully, I spelled that somewhat correctly. Um, and if I click uh, message patients here, um, it's going to send a uh, a notification out. Um, there we see popped up on the uh, on your device, Sachin. On my device here, so I'm just going to unlock my device. If and I if can anybody else how. has those app, apps over there, you should be able to see those notifications too. So I just go ahead and click on the notification, and there, um, my primary care physician is pre-selected for me. I choose the date that I want to do it on, and I'm going to do it like a couple months out. <laughs> yeah, what's the hurry? <laughs> There's no hurry. <laughs> so because um, he's trained, he's used to these days. Go to an HMO, they'll tell you what. <laughs> You're going to die tomorrow? It's okay. Our doctor is available two weeks down the line. <laughs> set it up. So and he's trained, pre-trained to set up his appointments uh, pretty late in the cycle. Far in advance. So yeah. he set up an appointment with just one click, right? The doctor sends, identifies the patients, sends out a message, and that goes to the mobile device where he can engage with the, his customer directly and instantaneously tell the person, looks like you're sick, get an appointment, come see me, right? That's what, because the symptoms alerts the doctor to how severe the situation is, and looks like he had what, scalitis is what it said somewhere over there. Scalitis. Yeah, there's some, some disease going around. Yes, so 
fantastic. Now that we have seen this thing, um, you also extended our um, sort of schemas over there and stuff like that that you did. What kind of trends and patterns are mm, you? I had, I had a feeling you were going to ask me about this. Um, if I come into our data... I want to see how viral all these apps really are. <laughs> um, so we've also wired in the uh, Couchbase Analytics service, which is mm -hmm. a new service that's in uh, developer preview, um, some of the early releases, um, and it lets us look over much larger volumes of data, um, do perform ad hoc, unindexed, um, multi uh, multi-level joins mm -hmm. and, and hash partitioning to, uh, to pull out trends that uh, are separate from your kind of transactional throughput workload. Um, so here we have a, a little page built. Uh, we can choose which disease we're going to. I think you're probably suffering from some scaleitis. Yes, I am. Um, and we, we might have a solution for that. Um, <laughs> so we choose that. We could drill down by city. We could drill down by gender. Um, and here I think we're going to group by social media because that's what we've been, we've been talking about. Um, so if I just click and uh, run this now, it takes... Uh, uh, just a couple seconds, mm -hmm. um, and comes back with a graph, um, so we can see you know thousands of, of records and patients uh, returned here. None. How do you explain none? So the the problem is we don't have any of this social media data in here. All of the data that we've been gathering is missing mm. that that section. It's probably some of the older people uh, in the in oh, the study. Really? Yeah. So many of you uh, should have this application you can go and enter your social media information onto the system and perhaps we can get to see what's happening over there? Uh, yes, uh, ho hopefully. So if uh, those of you who've been playing with this app over the last couple of days, if you could uh, just click in and just add, start adding some uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, or, or Snapchat records. Um, I'll give you a couple more seconds. Um, we don't need everybody to, to do it, just a few records. Um, but... Uh, so hopefully that's been uh, enough time. And if we come back and refresh this page, rerun the query, um, <clears throat> Uh, with the new data that's, uh, that's come in, in. Um, hopefully, there we go. Now we see that there's still all of those uh, mm -hmm. none, none. Uh, up there. But if I take that away, hide it off the graph, we can start Ooh. to see some of the trends of the, uh, the other social media. So this is the kind uh, of stuff that you have based on the schema extension. Now you're getting the data, and it's instantaneously showing me that in terms of what the social applications people are actually Exactly, and, and this, is, this is just showing us occurrences of, of scaleitis uh, with uh, patients that have entered their, uh, their social media data. So that yellow line, does that tell me that WhatsApp is the most viral of the three? It seems, it seems that WhatsApp is a bit more viral than Snapchat, yeah. Fantastic. Um, and if Virality we drill, has an entirely different meaning in this healthcare, but... <laughs> if we click on one of these works. points and drill down, we can see the, the people that have, have entered that information. Those are the, the few Snapchat users that are out there. See, hard um, really over even, there. Even hard, our own engineer. Probably. Um, Somebody is, did enter uh, that, I know, the data. Yep. Fantastic. He developed this whole app, so he should have a way to get his data in. He knows, he knows how to work with the data, yes. Thank fantastic. you, Fantastic. Lovely. So that's all fantastic. What you basically showed, Perry, can I request you to show the uh, place where or what the services are running so we can just generally get at least a sense of... Uh, sure. So you see we're, we're running all of this in Amazon, um, and this is the, the dashboard that I was working with before. Um, if we look down here, all of the, the servers, and we can sort by the service. So you mm -hmm. see we have some analytics, we have some full text and index, we have some query and, and data, data going on there. Um, supporting this, this particular application. Fantastic. Like you said, uh, you're running this all in the cloud. Yes. Now, I waxed eloquent in the morning about all kinds of failovers and failure scenarios and how the database still should be running. Is there any way you can um, simulate any of that? So I, I knew that you were going to ask me something about this. Yes. Um, and I have a couple different options, but I think, why don't, we, why don't we try moving this out of Amazon into Azure? You want to take a shot at that right on right, stage? Right now, right now. Let's see if we can, if we can do it. All right. All right. So, um, Please be patient. Um, and also, there are a lot of services here which are like in developer preview. You're taking a lot of chance to show <laughs> this thing. So Perry feels very comfortable jumping from cloud to cloud. So absolutely happy to see that happen. All right, let's see what we got. So if I come over into my Azure portal, um, this is the, the Microsoft Azure uh, portal for me uh, running on, on our account here. So you're going to start all the way from provisioning? I'm going to start all the, way from, all the way from scratch. Okay. Um, so in here, I can just Grab your cup of coffee. Nah, it won't take that long. Type Couchbase. Um, the Wi-Fi is being a little slow on us, but I can go and open up the marketplace, um, and this will take us to uh, just a couple of choices. Um, is it all Azure slowness? Nothing this is all Microsoft with, um, being slow. It has nothing to do with us, of course. Um, 
searching. Yeah, it's getting so really there. Thinking it's there we go. Okay. If so, only they had used Couchbase. <laughs> <laughs> so I can choose the Couchbase uh, image, the template, click Create. Um, this works a lot faster when nobody else is using the Oh, the Wi-Fi, Wi please. Everybody, yeah, yeah. everybody disconnect. disconnect. Everybody go to offline mode, <laughs> uh, except, for, except for you, Saki. Except you for stay, me. You stay online. Um, so we are creating this cluster. Yeah. I'm wondering if we should just kind of skip ahead a little bit. Um, Let us give it one more one minute. More, one more, every one of these clicks. There's about All five right. of them. Um, so if I add a username and hopefully type this password correctly, whew, there we go. Um, and we'll call this the connect SV. Click OK. Fantastic. This is actually uh, now going to what? Uh, it's going to do an extra layer of validation, ask me how many nodes I want. So let's say we're going to choose instead of five, we'll choose seven. Um, we need a little bit more disk space than that. Um, and click OK. Um, this is checking all of the parameters that I put in. This is all kind mm -hmm. of within the Azure Marketplace uh, mm -hmm. portal. Um, Couchbase is now uh, supported in there. Um, it's doing its final validation. In another, in another few seconds. Um, or minutes. No, hopefully no more minutes. We don't have that many minutes left. <laughs> Maybe um, uh, we want to really show this to you guys live as in how you can yep. these provision are the, the whole thing. These are the demo gods smiling down upon us. There, there it is. Okay, again, one more. I promise you only one more. So two clicks so far. Maybe three. Maybe, maybe three? No, no, so far only two. Two, two. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm counting the clicks. Yeah. And how many you can eliminate? Watching, watching the it. seconds. Yeah. Somewhere in there, I'm sure. Legal guys will get in the, there. Here's here's the legal guys. All right. So now now we're gonna click now we're gonna click create um, and that's gonna kick off a deployment and and actually this deployment takes you know seven to ten minutes which we, we don't have. Yes. Um, so if I come over here I had prepared a little bit uh, ahead of time. I have a cluster uh, running in Azure um, of uh, the seven seven nodes. Really, is it running in Azure? Can and these are running. You can see there, you can see the Azure the, host name up no, here. You can see the Azure the URL, uh, yes. host name here and I have mm -hmm. an empty bucket. So all I had to do was let that finish in Azure. Uh, sure. Create the bucket, and that's the, the state at which I'm at. Fantastic. Now. Um, so, in order to get the data moved over, mm. let's jump over to our back to our Amazon cluster, um, right from within the UI, or if you're using a, a script to, to do this, um, we're going to first uh, associate the two clusters together. So, we'll give it a name. I don't need to be in all caps. Um, get, enter the IP address. If you noticed, that was the one that I grabbed mm -hmm. from the cluster over there. Put in the right password. So that's just going to link the two clusters together. So now AWS can talk to our, our Azure cluster, and I'm exactly. going to choose which data set to replicate. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to choose the health bucket. We're going to choose the Azure cluster. This is all that we just added now. Yep. And we saw they had a health bucket over there. Um, nice. So with really just two or three clicks, um, we are now sending the data. Four, four clicks. Yeah. Four clicks. We're sending the data um, over to over to Azure. Four clicks and about four boxes. And a few, a few extra boxes. Yeah. yeah. My fingers are, are cold from yes. from typing. Um, so if we come over here and look at the statistics of this Azure cluster, the bucket. Um, yes. Did I click on it? I think yes, I clicked on did. it. Yeah. Have I clicked on it again? Yeah. The Wi-Fi is. The Wi-Fi. It's coming. Oh, that's because. Okay, I understand. All right, it's getting there. But it's get there. There we go. Okay. Whew. Um, so it'll basically, uh, uh, we are now moving the data. Yes, That's we're now, we're now moving the data, so you can see that it just started a few seconds ago. Yes. Um, we're up to... Uh, 80, 90 K uh, ops per yep, second? Yep, 80 to 90 K per second, and mm -hmm. about almost, 100 mil almost a million items. Um, okay. This should finish in another couple seconds. We can, yeah. we can actually watch this one finish. At least the network between the data centers isn't as screwed up as... It's, it not, it's not coming all the way down here and okay. then going back up there. Fantastic. Now. So <laughs> in respect to our Wi-Fi troubles, this is actually at least proceeding at the rate that we really wanted to exactly, uh, see exactly. that thing proceed. So you basically went to Azure through the marketplace, procured seven Couchbase servers, you set that up, then you set up one bucket over there, yep. and then you went to the, to the source, and you simply, from there, set up the XTCR replication to move the data uh, from the uh, Azure, so from the Amazon cluster to the Azure cluster. That's all you have done so exactly, far. Exactly, that's all we did. And, and uh, the nice thing about the marketplace is it sets up the whole cluster for you. And you are you saying that the million records have been moved now? Yes. So we can see this because graph here. Because it's all right down there. 
yep, this shows a million records and this shows the, uh, the incoming operations have, have finished now. Zero, nothing to do. Um, so if we go and look at the uh, a version of the application running over in Azure, mm -hmm. um, that pops up um, and we can see that it's, that it's working there as well. Fantastic, Azure uh, same application is showing. Exactly. Yep. So basically what you're saying is that right now, if the Amazon instance is down, that application is still available here and everything everything has been moved over to to Azure. We can support the two simultaneously, or yes, if one goes down or uh, God forbid one charges us too much and we have to take it away, we're we're safe with the other cloud. So three clicks on moving some code from here to there and you're ready to go. Exactly. The same application Sorry, just deployed in two clicks. clicks. Five clicks, all right. Okay. Fantastic. I'm happy with those number of clicks. At least I can still count them in one on hand. On one hand. If, even if we have to stay on two hands, I think yes. we're okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Now comes the difficult part. You got to convince me that this thing, actually dang thing work. It's oh, you not want me to show it, you want me show it actually working? This isn't, yes. this isn't enough for you. Yes. All right, well, uh, we can skip through some of the early stuff, but let's, let's take a, a look at if we can find mm -hmm. uh, Sachin again and through the same search. So we do this, and maybe I'll even spell it right this time. Did I? Well, thank you no, so much. No, not quite. Um, but that's okay. It came up anyway. Um, and if we map those results and uh, start to see the same, uh, let's Try no, to drill. Don't. Let's yeah. drill down a little bit into those uh, records, uh, so we get just the ones that we want here and here. Um, ah, there we are. There we are. Same. So same data uh, has moved over here. Sachin's record and everything is there. Mm -hmm. And um, since he made an appointment, so uh, uh, so far in advance. So far. Why don't we Why don't we send him a message and say he should do it a little bit sooner? Yeah. Hey, what Perry. a caring doctor you have here. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about that. But before you send me a message, we just changed our cloud providers. I think it's just fair that we change our um, mobile phone operating systems as well. Why not? So let's switch from the Android phone, which I just had on, to iOS. OK. And we have the same Couchbase Health application out, out here as well. Mm -hmm. And I'll let Perry send the message now. Urgent. OK. So uh, we're going to make it a little bit clearer that you need to have an appointment uh, <laughs> more, less than, at you. Less How than much three months away. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. Okay, so if I click this, hopefully we get to see a message. Oh, I heard ringing somebody. There it is. There so on the, on the iOS phone, you can and enter your, uh, your username and password in there. This is a brand new installation of the app, so I'm just going to hopefully remember my username and password. As you can see, it's the very secure password. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Wow. it's the same information over here this time around for today, gentlemen. Okay. And on your insistence at 4 p.m. So I'm not coming from a last session. Oh, I'm going good. to the doctor. That's good. Please, go, go directly. <laughs> Is that your own session? Um, so Fantastic. So what you guys, just to bring the point home here, what I, the way I see it is that there's a patient who has an incident and the doctor notices that and sends them information back. And within 15, 20 minutes, the doctor is able to get back to the patient saying that appointment that you set up is not good enough, come back sooner, while all hell has broken loose on the other end where the cloud has failed, where the application was working has failed. Yet, at the point of engagement, the customer doesn't see a difference. In fact, he's getting better care than before because the time that he set up for the appointment is something that the doctor doesn't feel acceptable. So this is fantastic. This brings the point home about how the whole platform sort of works all the way from the edge, the IoT, the moment you got the sensor reading all the way to the cloud and how it can work despite every kind of failure that is possible and slow networks and Azure issues and all that stuff. <laughs> fantastic, gentlemen. This is really amazing. It's always a pleasure to stand with you guys and show the world more than just talk about how we wanted to build this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you Thank all. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you all. So this is not where I want to end this for you guys. This is just a demo to show you uh, how the whole system works. I have this whole thing planned to be a, a three-act play. So the act two, I want to bring onto the stage some of the, the creative thinkers, our own revolutionaries, who conceived and built this. Uh, platform. So they were instrumental in basically building many of the features here. I want to get in front of you a panel of those brilliant engineers who developed this whole uh, application or our database platform. 
to give you better insight into what goes underneath the hood to make this happen. A uh, lot of stuff looks pretty simple, but it's like the tip of the iceberg. 98% is under the water, so let me give you a, a better sense of what all goes underneath the covers and to give you a better perspective, hear it from the horse's mouth. I'm gonna invite some of our engineers up onto the stage. First, uh, let me invite Wayne Carter, our mind behind everything mobile. Come on up, Wayne. Good to see you, Wayne. Next up, let me invite Keisha. He represents and he leads our query team. All the squiggly brackets magic. Welcome, Keisha. We introduced with Fivo today, fresh off the press, uh, search, full text search. The man behind it, Marty Shock. Marty, you, pleasure. You all got to see something which is not yet in production, which is uh, analytics. And let's uh, get Till up on the stage to give us a sense of where analytics is. Till, pleasure. And last but not the least, all the way from Manchester, man behind many of the stuff that's sitting underneath the hood in the server, Dave Rigby. Welcome, Dave. So gentlemen, let me kick off with all the stuff that we actually saw in the order that we actually saw this, so it uh, gives a pretty clear sense of what's happened in the demo and what is behind in our uh, platform. So Wayne, um, uh, it all looked pretty simple. Is it that simple, all the way from the edge to the cloud? Yeah, Ravi, I agree. It, it did look simple, and that's the elegance of it. There's a lot going on inside the platform. So when the temperature was taken and it just showed up on the server, that just happened. It looked simple, right? But in the background, the platform was performing a lot of complex actions to make that happen um, safely and correctly. So if we look at our platform, it comp it's comprised of three primary components. At the database here, we have Couchbase Server for managing and accessing data in any cloud. In the middle tier, we have Sync Gateway, our secure web gateway for managing and accessing data directly over the web. And on the client tier, we have Couchbase Lite, our embedded, full-featured, NoSQL uh, database for managing and accessing data on the device. And the communication between those components is fully managed and secure. So if we look at the first case where the temp reading was taken on the client and synchronized up to the server, that all looked really simple, but really what happened on, inside the platform was a lot of other things. So the, the temperature reading was made, that change was detected by Couchbase Lite, a secure connection was made between Couchbase Lite and the gateway, the user for the application was authenticated against the gateway, the, da the data was then sent from Couchbase Lite to the gateway, the gateway in, enforced the user's access control policies, validated the data that was sent, and then finally, on success, push that into Couchbase Server. And on the second case, where the profile was changed on the server side while the app was offline, the reverse happened. So the change was inserted into Couchbase Server using the SDK. That change was detected by Sync Gateway. The access control policies for all the connected users was evaluated. The data change was pushed from the gateway down to the correct Couchbase Lite instances, Couchbase Lite, raised a data change event to the application code, and then finally the application code updated the UI, so seamlessly. And so all of that in real time, across platform, and just works. Fantastic, so basically, Wayne, there was nothing, no mobile backend as a service, no integration, nothing extraneous was involved, it was all just this one Couchbase data platform that was used for the entire end-to-end -end experience that the both sides uh, got to see? Exactly, so it's all Couchbase. It was the platform doing all of that work. So the Couchbase platform resolves the storage, access, transport, and security concerns of managing data across all the layers in the application stack and network stack. So that's really empowering, empowering, empowering for developers. Um, the platform does all of your full stack data management, and then the developers are freed up to build the actual features that their customers need. Fantastic. 
way now, let me turn the focus a bit to what was happening on the server side. A um, lot of squiggly braces, a lot of stuff was happening over there. To me, that's all a lot of data processing and objects. Yeah. Uh, that's the world we are over there. So give us an insight as to what is happening over there. It's all a lot of data processing. Your yeah, yes, Ravi. There was a lot of uh, JSON floating around all, all around there. So the apps don't live in a flat world. Right? Mm -hmm. The apps themselves live in the hierarchical, object-oriented mm -hmm. and uh, objects and ob object-oriented uh, programming. Right? Yes. So JSON and objects go well together. Right? Uh, objects are represented and mapped to JSON very yeah. well. Yes. Since JSON is self-describing, mm -hmm. they are also they also become flexible. Mm -hmm. JSON describes its own metadata and data, right? So, so when you see a JSON, you're able to interpret very easily. That means you're able to change the JSON very easily. Mm -hmm. you know? Businesses and reality drive the change in the applications, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Those changes have to be persisted in the JSON, as in the, in the database, mm -hmm. right? Changes to the objects and the persistence layer used to be difficult mm -hmm. before JSON. True. Right? Uh, so after the JSON, the change becomes easier. In your demo, you showed uh, the contacts, the, the telecom, going mm -hmm. from a simple phone number yep. to a set of series multi of multi-valued uh, multi mm -hmm. social uh, contacts. Yep. Right? And if you noticed, it's not just data that had the data, the uh, Sachin's uh, contact numbers, yes. but even the metadata had information, yes. right? whether it's WhatsApp, Facebook, and everything. Mm -hmm. So the complete JSON has a lot of information out there. Mm -hmm. So we have added Nickel as a declarative data access uh, uh, language, language and the engine to manipulate both data and metadata. This, this makes the whole uh, data platform mm -hmm. programmable because you're able to access mm -hmm. data and metadata mm -hmm. seamlessly. So in one sense, what you're saying is that Nickel manipulates both the metadata and the data, so basically it manipulates schema and the data mm -hmm. put differently, right? That's exactly so, right. So um, all that is good, but uh, what is in it for the developer? How does it enable the developer? Yeah. Th that's a very good point. Eventually it's about the developer, right? Yes. And today we, the apps live in the JSON world. They, uh, like you said, JSON is floating all around. Mm -hmm. And we also live in the world of services and microservices. Mm -hmm. All of them exchange data through JSON, right? So Nickel can interrogate or interact with any JSON endpoint, internal or external. In your demo, we went to a, we, we joined the data, patient mm -hmm. data that was in the Couchbase database, mm -hmm. joined with the data in Google through the Google mm -hmm. API, mm -hmm. got the lat long, mm -hmm. and then we were able to determine the nearest hospital mm -hmm. for the current location mm -hmm. through again just an API call and get the data you wanted and the render in the Google mm -hmm. Maps. Mm -hmm. That means every time you see a SQL, that means your developer has reduced thousands of lines of code. code. Right? Yeah. Do you think it will help your developers? I hope so. I hope others feel that way. And uh, I'm really, I'm excited in terms of where it can go because it's a SQL, if you realize, is also the first functional language. So you describe yes. what you want to do and let the you know, how of it be left to the system to figure out. So the SQL, no SQL relationship is sort of, uh, the nickel relationship is very interesting. It's mm -hmm. a bridge mm -hmm. to come over from the relational world to a no SQL world. Um, a lot of enterprises are currently relational system shop, if you yes. will, right? Um, what does it mean to them? How can they exploit a no SQL system which has a SQL on top? Yeah, another uh, good question, Ravi. So now we have three classes of databases, right? Transactional, analytical, and engagement databases, mm -hmm. right? Under the hood, uh, transactional databases like SQL Server, Oracle, or analytical databases like uh, uh, Teradata, mm -hmm. under the hood, they're all different, yep. but they all speak the same language, mm -hmm. right? The declarative SQL language. Yep. What Nickel does is to bring the essence of this great language mm -hmm into NoSQL world and the engagement database. Mm -hmm. okay? So by using the declarative la uh, language, the developers 
the Oracle developers, uh -huh. DBAs, uh -huh. architects uh -huh. can pick up SQL uh -huh. quickly yep. and more importantly, start developing immediately. Good, so there is no learning curve. So all the investment that you've really done is sort of preserved and they can bring that skill. It's just underneath data storage, why do you care? The way you interact with this, it's almost like the Tesla example we used to say that you changed out the engine, the rest of the interface, the steering wheel, and everything remains the same. I mean, absolutely, that's absolutely. You don't need to take an extra driving test to drive Tesla. Exactly. You just need a check. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Fantastic. Now, Marty, the new kid on the block, the <laughs> brand new search. Um, we talked about structured query and all that stuff. Uh, how does FTS fit into all this? What did you see by adding this? Uh, how are we going to benefit? Sure. Uh, so adding Nickel uh, to the Couchbase data platform for structured access has been a huge success. And so we really wanted to build on that success. Uh, we started looking for other ways that we could help users interact with their data. And the obvious fit was a full-text search capability. Now, between search and query, sometimes it's not obvious what the differences are. So we've distilled it down to three main things. First, search needs to be able to transparently search across multiple fields within your document. Second, search needs the ability to, be, to go beyond just exact matching of values. Users need to be able to configure fields for language-based stemming, and they need to be able to do fuzzy matching at search time. And finally, full-text search results are returned in an order ordered by their relevance score. And the relevance score is a measure of how well a document matches your search query. So as you saw in the demo, search is a really good fit with the rest of the Couchbase platform. But typically, Marty, the search is something that we've always seen being implemented separately. It's like an adjacency to databases. We've seen so many famous examples of that. Um, how does this you know, help? What is the advantage of having it in the same system? Sure. The biggest advantage of putting search directly into Couchbase is that you don't need to manage a separate infrastructure just for search. Second, we find it means developers don't need to be concerned with updating records in multiple places. They can just update the document in Couchbase, and now it's up to us to make sure that the search index stays up to date. Having search as a part of the platform is really exciting, and we can't wait to get on to the next step, integrating with Nickel, Analytics, and Mobile. Fantastic. So now we are basically um, went from structured query language to a search, which is basically information retrieval. And so then we also showed next the analytics piece of it, which is more about finding the insights into this thing. Um, so we saw the real-time analytics in the demo here, um, but isn't it just traditional data warehousing? Well, there is at least one big difference between traditional warehousing and what we're doing here today. Mm -hmm. So the analytics that you saw running were running on the application data and the way the application was designed and the mm -hmm. way the application needed it. Okay. And when new data or new fields were added, we saw basically we could run on that natural form. Mm -hmm. We could run on analytics on that natural form. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing that we didn't see in here is mm -hmm. basically to, in order to run those analytics, we did not have to design a warehouse schema. We did not create an ETL workflow. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to adapt a job when new fields came in. Mm -hmm. So one way to put it is that we're kind of adding no ETL to no SQL. Ah, fantastic. If you, this is the way engineers market. <laughs> Adding no ETL to no SQL. That's uh, exactly what we have achieved here. And, uh, but since you know more than just uh, a byline, uh, educate us, uh, tell on uh, why is that so important? There are two reasons here. The first reason is the developer agility. So mm -hmm. the, basically you work on your same data model. You work on the yes. same data model with the same tools, with mm -hmm. the same... SDKs that you do to, to work, build your application. So you're yeah. just faster, right? You, you know your mm -hmm. tools, you know how to deal with it. Um, the other thing is you don't have ETL, so therefore you don't need to adapt ETL. Again, a development advantage for you mm -hmm. to increase your agility. Mm -hmm. The other interesting aspect is the timeliness. As mm -hmm. you saw, basically the data that you want to analyze was available to analyze immediately. Mm -hmm. So there was no time gap. Often if you have an ETL job mm -hmm. running, what's happening is it runs on the weekend or on the night, and so Actually, the insight that you get, you only get at a later stage. Interesting. So this, to me, feels like something that can open up a lot of very interesting opportunities and possibilities on how applications will be built in the future. 
uh, with the sort of near time, uh, near real time insights, the benefits of that. That's exactly right, and that's our goal. And, but coming back to your question about the similarity to data warehousing, there mm -hmm. is a big similarity under the hood. So if you look at today's database management systems that are used for data warehousing, mm -hmm. they use massively parallel processing mm -hmm. to get FTP. results on large amounts of data in a timely way. Yes. And so under the hood, uh, analytics has similar ad hoc, no, similar algorithms to use um, to support the scale out of our query processing. So analytics has a full multi-parallel. Massively parallel. Massively parallel processing. Query processor right. under the hood. Yeah. And basically you're able to run, to split the work that you need to answer a single query onto all the cores of all the analytics nodes in a cluster. And the way we built it is also is that this, one of the reasons why operational analyticals always stayed separate is because of the kind of contention you'd normally have. And by keeping this isolated, you're now, exactly. your analytic workload is not impeding the uh, operational side of the house. That is exactly right. Fantastic. And, so. and, and by the fact that we have this immediate availability of the data that I talked about before, mm -hmm. and this query processor that can basically use all of the capacity in the cluster mm -hmm. to answer those queries, we can really reduce the time that it takes to get your insight from your data. So we're reducing the time to insight for our business users. For our business users. So that's the business value for the developers is the value of being able to program in the uniform uh, SQL paradigm exactly. that they're used to. Fantastic. So we are a, uh, as, I, as, I, as I was saying earlier, we are showcased this even though it's in developer preview. So obviously the next logical question to put you on the spot is when can we have this for so our customers? We, we can have the great developer preview for, we can have it today, it's available in our today. So you can oh. download and play with it. And well, it will be generally available once it's ready for your data. <laughs> He's smart, he's not putting me on the spot. And then, what is the date, Ravi? Um, so the DP4 is available as of today, which has got uh, some great additional feature functionality. Please do um, download and play with that. Uh, and uh, as soon as it is ready for your consumption, we'll release it. Uh, fantastic. Now, we are one platform, so I have to put Wayne on the spot here. Uh, since we are, it should look, appear, and program the same way. It doesn't matter where you come from. So. Uh, you have a lot of illustrious stuff here. Um, when will that be available? Uh, are there plans? Are we thinking in terms of making it uh, available from the edge as well? We are. We are, Ravi. Um, so Query and FTS are available in 2.0, which is in developer preview now, so you can grab it and play with it um, today. Um, and then for analytics, we have some great things in mind for uh, 3.0. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So we'll have one uniform programming experience for all the developers once we have that in place. Lovely. Now, a lot of stuff has happened. Great new feature functionality has come. But as you know, underneath the covers, unless the server stands up and is able to do all the magic of being robust and reliable and performant, um, you know, it, it only goes so far. So what have we done in terms of... Uh, all the, the failure scenarios that we talked about and uh, that I've been harping on as to how good we are. So educate us uh, in 5 out how we have moved the needle. Yeah, sure, Ravi. So ensuring that data continues to be available in the face of um, issues is critical for any um, mission critical database. Mm -hmm. This ranges from software, hardware, network, rack, or even mobile phone tower issues. Kershaw server has got a long list of features to deal with this mm -hmm. uh, from Rack zone awareness to deal with the loss of a whole rack to XDCR to uh, synchronize to a disaster recovery site automatically. Um, but one we've had since 1.0 is auto failover. So the ability of the cluster to automatically detect that there's been an issue with a node and then promote replica copies of that data to ensure the data maintain, uh, continues to be available. Um, so in 5.0, we've made auto failover even better. Mm -hmm. uh, we've added an improved failure detection mechanism. So we now have a per service. Um, pluggable architecture allows us to monitor in more detail what those services are doing. So for example, ensuring that the replication traffic between data nodes is monitored. Mm -hmm. um, this gives us a richer set of inputs for the cluster managers to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and as a consequence, it can detect failures quicker and more robustly. Mm -hmm. um, so what this actually means now is that we can reduce the time it takes for us to detect and act on a failure from a minimum of 30 seconds previously down to under eight seconds. Fantastic, single digits. So less than eight seconds to detect a failover of a node and bring back in 
fully functioning systems, I've seen simple web pages take more than 15, 20 seconds to just refresh them. But here you're able to auto-detect a node's non-availability, and you're able to fail that over so that the other node can pick and the service is still up uninterrupted. Exactly. Fantastic. This is really, this is next to rocket science, the kind of stuff you have to do here to make this thing happen. So fantastic. Now, we always, one of the key portions of Couchbase, key element in our DNA is performance. And we never give that up, no matter what the release is, no, much, no matter how much lines of code we add, we always make sure that the performance holds up to the standards that people are used to. So anything we have done in 5.0 for performance? Yeah, sure, Ravi. So, I mean, as you said, performance at scale has always been at the heart of what we've done here at Couchbase. Um, and we always try to improve that. Mm -hmm. um, and 5.0 is no different. So, I mean, we've had improvements across the board, but to give you some examples, um, the data service is up to 50% faster throughput in higher core count systems. Um, XDCR also is up to 50% faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Query, Query has a range of um, order of magnitude improvements from pagination, counts, array indexing, unnest, to name a few. Um, but another important aspect of performance is efficiency, mm -hmm. you know, doing the most with the least resources. Um, so to give an example, um, what if your workload fits in memory, um, but you still require you know, a high performance, uh, high throughput, low latency uh, system? Could we simplify things and remove the disk layer? Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we've done in 5.0. We've added a new bucket type, uh, ephemeral buckets. Um, so as the name suggests, this is an in-memory bucket type, so it doesn't require any disk layer. Mm -hmm. But it still supports all the availability and scalability features of Couchbase server, so rebalance, um, uh, auto failover, backup and restore. And then it supports all the features we've been talking about today, so data service, uh, query, indexing, and, and full text search. Fantastic. So that gives a pretty good uh, rounding of all that we have basically built all the way from the mobile stuff to the stuff that we're doing on the server to preserve the performance uh, no matter how much more new types of workload we're adding to the system. So what you heard uh, from the people who invented this stuff is the amount of detail and the amount of engineering it takes to make that whole demo work in half an hour. Otherwise, if you, were, if you had the age-old system, just the setting up and running with this one would take us years and months before you can actually move the data that fluidly. So uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to sit with uh, these gentlemen here and explain to you how this whole thing works. So thank you all for your contributions of what you build, not just for being here, but in terms of leading your teams and building what you do. And then there is a team of people behind you all the way from development to QE and performance who actually make the whole thing happen. So my sincere gratitude to all of you for what you do. And I'm sure, and I've heard from our customers how much they appreciate uh, the elegance of this platform. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you all here. So that's our brilliant panel, our set of revolutionaries. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Till. Thank you. Marty, as usual, a pleasure. Keshav. Wayne, thank you so much. And for my final act, When you talk about disruption or building something new, one mistake all um, inventors make is the classic adage, which says that those who forget history are condemned to repeat it. So you simply start to believe that you're doing something so, so great that whatever has happened before is somehow not relevant, or you've actually done something dramatically different. In the database world, there have been a lot of great innovations that have been done in the past. And where we are doing what we are doing is by standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of what they built and showed us the way in terms of how database platforms need to be built. There are a lot of great lessons that we have learned from there. And to give you a sense as how valuable we feel what we're building, the validation of that, one such giant is the gentleman who invented SQL. So let me introduce you to such a revolutionary, such a giant, who has really helped us guide through all of this stuff. Let me get up on the stage, Don Chamberlain, who invented SQL some 40 odd years ago. Welcome, Don. Good to have you, Don. Pleasure to be here. Please, let's 
grab the center ones this time. So, Don, um, let me ask this question. When this whole NoSQL movement started, how personal was it for you? SQL is your baby, and now everybody's saying NoSQL. Well, Ravi, I, I figure that uh, when a language is uh, so well recognized that other languages start defining themselves as not that one, <laughs> uh, must be doing pretty well. Pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, but, but more seriously, uh, I don't think any single language is the answer to all applications. Uh, yes. I think SQL does a good job of the data, kinds of data that it was designed for, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, other kinds of uh, data yeah. may have other requirements. So give us a little historical perspective on SQL um, when you conceived of it. Well, as you know, I spent most of my career in the relational database world. Mm -hmm. That's a very uh, predictable and simple world. Mm -hmm. Every table has a schema. Uh, every row looks the same. Uh, all the values in a column have the same type. So it's, that's very nice. And uh, uh, compilers are able to take advantage of all this type information for building a, a, a query plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of uh, data, of course, uh, fits the very nicely data. into that paradigm. Uh, understood, and the, but the world has sort of evolved since then, would you say? The world is always changing. So uh, <laughs> uh, nowadays, as you know, uh, there are a lot of applications that uh, deal with data that doesn't fit very nicely into mm -hmm. rows and columns, or mm -hmm. at least you might have to distribute it across multiple tables, yes. and that's, uh, that raises some, some problems of its own. Uh, so we hear more about uh, semi-structured data that's mm -hmm. in formats like XML and uh, JSON. And it's, uh, it's reasonable to ask what kind of language is uh, well, mm -hmm. well adapted to that new kind of data. And, uh, and frankly, it's not obvious at first that uh, SQL is the answer, is to, the that answer question. to that And you at some point even had argued against SQL, am I, I right? I did that, Ravi. It was, <laughs> I, uh, I was for a while participating in a uh, W3C working group mm -hmm. to define a query language for XML. Uh, eventually they produced the language XQuery. And uh, in that working group, I, uh, I argued that uh, SQL was not a very good match for XML. Mm -hmm. If I was designing a language for querying XML, SQL probably is not the language that I would design. <laughs> uh, but then I started hearing about uh, some uh, dialects of SQL that were being designed especially for, uh, for querying JSON. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard about Nickel at Couchbase, and mm -hmm. there's uh, SQL++ at uh, UC San Diego, and, mm -hmm. There's the uh, Asterix project at UC Irvine, and yep. I started to scratch my head. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, yeah. JSON doesn't look like tables. Uh, how can this be? <laughs> Were you pleasantly surprised to see SQL uh, becoming relevant and prevalent again in the NoSQL uh, world? Actually, I was. Uh, the more I learned and thought about it, mm -hmm. uh, the more it seemed to me that uh, JSON looks a little bit like tables. You, mm -hmm. you sort of have to squint. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, JSON has objects, and yes. you can sort of imagine that an object is kind of like a row, and, yeah. and JSON has arrays, mm -hmm. and you have an array of objects. That's, if you squint enough, that's sort of like a table. Uh, there's, there's still some surprises in it, yes. of course. Uh, not all the rows look the same in the table, and uh, you, can have uh, table you might have table. tables inside yeah. other tables, yeah. so that's not relational. So, so the trick here is to extend the semantics to uh, encompass these non-relational features mm -hmm. while retaining as much of the original familiar SQL syntax as you can. Uh, in fact, a uh, nickel query operating on a JSON array of objects uh, looks and behaves pretty much like a SQL, SQL. query on a table. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not real easy to make that happen because you don't have the schema information that you usually uh, would rely on. So I think what, what people are trying to do is to preserve the investment in SQL mm -hmm. uh, while relaxing some of the constraints of the mm -hmm. relational data model. And yes. I think that's really interesting work. Fantastic. Now that you've seen how far this has come, so Don, how do you think the future looks? What other parting thoughts can you give us? Well, uh, I, I want to learn more about uh, uh, these new uh, SQL for JSON uh, languages, and I'm especially interested in seeing how uh, they're used in production and mm -hmm. what kinds of experience real, uh, real production users at scale have yes. with these languages. Um, I, uh, 
I don't have any crystal ball, so uh, we'll have to come back here next week, next year, and come to connect again and find out what's happened in the meantime. But one thing I can tell you, um, this is a time of rapid change, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a really exciting time to be in the database. The database business. as well, fantastic. Don himself has said, come back here next year for more innovation. So make your appointments to be here next time. Thank you so much, Don, for sharing the time and your guidance. Thank we you, Drake. learned a lot from you, and we can also learn humility from you. Well, pleasure Thank to you. be here. So as you heard, um, SQL is the only language in, uh, that databases have always understood. And so we brought that to the NoSQL platform. Um, and made the whole thing work with one programming language, be it for your operational need, and our ambition is to do the same for the analytical side of the house. And by bringing the power of SQL to JSON, what we have basically done is marry or amplify the schema flexibility that is sitting inside JSON to the power of the querying capability that SQL has basically brought to the relational world some 40 odd years ago. So the developer ease comes from there, and the rest of the world uh, that invented the NoSQL movement was about scalability, horizontal scalability, and elasticity. So we brought that, so we married a system which is easy to develop on, and you can deploy and scale uh, to the web scale. So that's the Couchbase data platform which basically is easy to develop and deploy at any scale, be the data, may the data be at the edge or on the cloud. So I hope you all enjoyed the show. I hope it wasn't monotonous, especially when you have come right back from lunch, and I hope you learned something in terms of how we have conceived and what we have built, and you got to understand how the whole thing works. So thank you so much for coming here and sharing your time with us. Hopefully you'll get to learn more from the various sessions that is over there. And uh, some of these gentlemen who shared the stage with me are also presenting various sessions. So please uh, pick your poison and share your time with them. You'll have a fun time learning more stuff. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>